Please welcome Ibi Padirulu. I'm a bundle of nervous energy, so try to use that. Uh, and what better way to break the ice than to show you my baby picture? That's me. Um, actually, no, I, I'm not a Viking, but at one point they did feed me like one. Um, but I am a nerd at heart. Um, I have been in the gaming industry now for about 20 years. Uh, my career started at Looking Glass Studios in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, where I worked on Thief Gold. That was my first game. Uh, very exciting period of my life. Um, Thief 2 um, was my first major project. And it was, if you've seen the movie Good Will Hunting, it was very much like that. It was a, a kid from South Boston working with these MIT geniuses. And they accepted me in, and I learned a lot. Uh, and from there I went to uh, Ion Austin and worked on Thief Deadly Shadows. But for the last 13 years I've been at Bethesda Game Studios. Uh, the first game I worked on there was Blood Moon, the expansion to Morrowind. Uh, then from there, Oblivion, and Skyrim, of course. Um, but really, I, I've been known as the Fallout guy, sort of. I, my first big gig at Bethesda was uh, as lead designer and writer of Fallout 3, and then most recently, Fallout Shelter, which just sort of came out of nowhere and, and was a big hit for us, and, uh, and Fallout 4, the most recent thing I worked on. Um, so why am I here? in Copenhagen. I don't do this. I don't speak. I prefer to stay in my office and make games. Um, this is why. This, this happy couple right here, right? Clearly happy, clearly drunk, okay? Where was this picture taken? Copenhagen. These are my parents, okay? This picture was taken, oh God, uh, 1979. My parents left for a week, okay? They came back happier than I had ever seen them. And, uh, and I remember seeing these pictures, and that's why they came here to Copenhagen for a week. So I knew there was something magical here. Um, but, it, but it's not just that, right? It's Copenhagen in Denmark. You guys have games, right? You guys know games. Um, and it's almost surprising when you see how many games are made here. Uh, Woo Woo and Company, right? Limbo, of course. Uh, Max, Curse of Brotherhood, right? Subway Surfers, huge hit. One of my personal favorites, Hitman, right? But of course, when I think of Danish gaming, Chili Con Carnage, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. So what's the story with Bethesda's stories? How do we make our stories, and how do I personally make my stories? Um, I thought, you know, it's funny, I, I had never really thought of the process that I use to write stories and make games, and then I realized I do have a process. Um, and I started to put it together, I realized that there are three primary points that I use when I create a story for one of our games. So I thought I'd run through those three points um, for everyone here today. Um, the first is, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. This is my own personal rule for myself, right? And I'll go through each of these individually. Um, the next, write what you know. One of the oldest, one of the oldest um, tricks for writing, right? Right, we know, it's true. And three, this is a big one. Great games are played, not made. This is one of Bethesda's studio mottos, but this is a personal motto for me as well. So, going to the first point. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. What does that mean? Well, for me, that means when I'm coming up with a story for a game, I like to concentrate on strong central themes. And one or two strong central themes is enough. Um, I find that, think of a good movie or think of a good game. And you can usually think of a good movie or a good game with a good story, and you can usually realize that there's a strong central theme, a strong undercurrent, right? See a bad movie, play a bad game with a bad story, and it's usually, sometimes it's a mess. I saw a movie recently, which I will not name, um, that was kind of a mess, and the story was all over the place, and it really didn't know what it wanted to be. Um, so Casablanca, one of my favorite movies, right? Ask yourself, what is Casablanca about? I mean, look at the picture, it's, about, it's a love story, right? It is, but if you look deeper at Casablanca, Casablanca is about sacrifice, right? It's giving up what you love for something greater. Um, the Incredibles. A uh, movie about superheroes, right? Not really. It's a movie about family. It's a movie that says we are stronger as a group than we are on our own. 
okay? Uh, the Great Mads Mikkelsen. This is a Danish movie, The Hunt, right? Great movie. Um, this is a movie about a man who is wrongfully accused of a horrible crime. And the movie is about that, but if you look at the, the underpinnings of that movie, the movie is really about loneliness and isolation and what it feels like to be totally separate and isolated from everyone around you. Um, and of course this, um, you know, this is for film, but this is the same for games as well, right? Uh, this war of mine, what is this game about? Like, you know, war obviously, but I mean, you look at what is the story about, it's about sacrifice, it's about survival, right? And it's about making very hard decisions about what's important. Um, Gone Home, great game. Uh, a, a game whose story is, is, is not very obvious when you play it. Uh, when you play this game, you, you know, you return home uh, and your house is deserted, you don't know where your family is, you think it's a horror game. And you know, by the end you realize, no, that the actual story of the game is about a young girl's you know, um, search for self-discovery, basically. Um, and of course, The Last of Us. If you think of a game with a great story, a lot of people think of The Last of Us. Um, and that sort of combines the themes of, you know, of family, of uh, survival, um, you know, and, and about working together. So it's a, it's a game about a virus and a post-apocalypse, but really it's the story of these two characters and how they're trying to work together, right? And, you know, Skyrim. Skyrim is a game about dragons, right? Even in the studio. What is the game about? It's about dragons. But the story is not really about dragons, right? It is about the lone hero, right? The, the, it actually, it is, it is much more biblical than any, a lot of the other stories we've done. It's about it, the, the dragonborn, the Dovahkiin, is much more of a messiah sort of character. Um, and you know, when you look at Fallout 4, so Fallout 4 is about androids, right? Um, or is it? I mean, the Fallout 4, there are a lot of themes, right? The Fallout 4 is about 1950s Americana, or Fallout 4 is about, um, you know, the post-apocalypse. But at its core, Fallout 4 is about androids that look like humans, okay? And so the theme, one of the, and this, is, this became a very important point for us, and it's something that we didn't realize until a little late in pre-production, the, the most important theme in Fallout 4 is suspicion. Who is this person sitting next to me? Are they human? Do they want to do me harm? Um, which is a theme that is very relevant in the world today, right? Um, it, you know, am I human? What are my own motivations? Um, and so that, when you look at the themes of Fallout 4, that was most important to me. Um, now going to the second point, write what you know. What does this mean, write what you know? Does this mean that if you are working as a dishwasher and decide to become a game developer, you need to make a game about washing dishes? No. Though that would be a fun game. So an HTC Live game with a headset washing dishes would be really cool. Uh, no, it means that you, actually, I'll show you this. Did, this person right there, right? Not a, you, you probably don't recognize him. His face is not very memorable, right? Uh, does anybody know who he is? Yes, Hayao hey, Miyazaki, right? Um, creator of some of the best stories that we've seen in, in anime, right? And he got into a little bit of hot water recently. He made some comments online um, that, that circulated online that had become memes and everything. And He had said that the state of anime currently was going downhill. And people, you know, attributed and said, oh my god, Miyazaki doesn't like anime anymore. And, it, and, and no, they, they completely missed the point. What he said was, the people who are creating anime now have stopped observing other people. They have stopped, uh, stopped observing life. So in order to write what you know, you have to know something. You have to live. You have to observe people and, you know, and so... Write what you know, for me, means that you draw upon your personal experiences. So for me, um, one of my biggest, uh, my first big break at Bethesda was uh, around 2006, when we started working on Oblivion, I was tasked with creating the Dark Brotherhood, which is the Assassin's Guild. Um, 
and I, I wanted to sort of leverage the experience I had um, at, at Looking Glass Studios working on the Thief games. Um, and Thief is about sneaking around and, and, you know, and stealing stuff. I want to sneak around and stab people in the face. Um, I thought that would be fun. Uh, so, you know, but you know, what do I know? Write what you know. What do I know about being a medieval or fantasy assassin? Not a lot, right? I, there are certainly people I would like to kill, um, but I have not yet had the experience, so what do I know? What, I, so, so what I did, at this point in Bethesda, the fiction was sort of malleable, like there, the, the Elder Scrolls had had a, longer, a long history, but everything was sort of all over the place, so the designers at that point were given sort of carte blanche to create our own stories and do what we wanted, so I thought to myself, how could I relate this you know, an evil assassin's guild to my own personal experiences. It's like, I don't know what this is, bah, but I do know. I know the Catholic Church. I grew up Catholic. And so, actually, the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion, the story is actually an evil take on the Catholic Church. There is, uh, it's true, uh, Sithis, the Dread Father, is actually an, an, an evil take on, on God. Um, the Night Mother is an evil version of Mary. Um, I know I'm going to hell when this is over, so <laughs> it's fine. Uh, you know, so I, I drew upon those experiences. And so when we came to Fallout 4, um, the game is set in Boston, okay? I grew up in Boston. Uh, so, you know, for me it was easy, right? I, I knew that I could use my own experiences um, and leverage that in telling the story. So, you know, and these are places, these are literally places I grew up. You know, Fenway Park became Diamond City. Um, the Hack Shell, where they have concerts, became, what is I think there's a cult, a crazy cult in the game. Uh, and the Swan Boats, uh, where I grew up going to the Swan Boats. Uh, you know, that's in the game. There's a, I won't tell you what's there, spoilers. Uh, but you know, I have been to all these locations. In this place right here, this is Joe's Sandwich Shop. Um, a location that I was very familiar with. Uh, that is also in the game. And that is where I grew up. Humble place. That's the street I grew up. And of course, I had to put my bedroom in the game. <laughs> All right, right? So, so I was able to leverage my own personal experiences, obviously. Uh, write what you know. I know Boston. But let's say I didn't grow up in Boston. In fact, the game was not set there originally. I still have a design document in my desk um, early on in pre-production that the game was set in an entirely different location. Um, it's a location that we decided to change, and I was not the one to decide to set the game in Boston, by the way. Very happy we did for obvious reasons. But let's say the game wasn't set there. Could I still write what I know? Could I still write the story of Fallout 4? Fallout 4, at its heart, is the story of two men. Young Emil Padme Rouleau, there with his Mickey Mouse pancakes, and Johnny Depp. <laughs> all, right, all right, not exactly, not, not really Johnny Depp. Actually, if you've seen the movie Black Mass, Johnny Depp portrayed a character, a man named James Whitey Bulger, okay? There's the real man right there, pretty good flexibility. Um, when I was growing up in Boston, James Whitey Bulger was the head of the Irish Mafia, crime boss. Um, and the thing is, that picture right there, I, I had seen that picture for the first time maybe 10 years ago. Nobody knew what he looked like. Uh, he was a, he was a mystery. Even as a kid, you just knew. He owned a, a tavern. And, and the stories, even when I was eight, nine years old, if you went into that tavern, you wouldn't come out. So when I was a kid, James Whitey Bulger was the monster in the closet. He was the mysterious, unknown evil that was out there, okay? You didn't know where. No one knew where he was or how to get to him, but you knew he was out there. You knew he was controlling things. And so I leveraged that experience I had growing up and, and you know, that thing with Whitey Vulture and to translate that into Fallout 4. So in Fallout 4, the main fictional story beat is about an organization that is the monster in the closet, that is the shadow. The, you hear about but you don't see, and that is the Institute. And so the Institute in Fallout 4 is actually 
James Whitey Bulger. That's, I drew upon those personal experiences, those experiences of fear and suspicion, um, and sort of leverage that. So write what you know simply means draw upon your own personal experiences. I mean, that's, that's what it means for me, and that's what I try to relay to my, to my team when I'm talking to them. And actually, if you create James Whitey Bulger in the game, he's a hell of a bad guy. You can, you can play as him, it's great. Uh, and my third point is, and my third point and the longest point, and all of these sort of tie together, but great games are played and not made. So this is a, this is a point for the studio. This is one of our mottos at the studio, but it has several meanings. Um, on a studio-wide level, great games are played, not made, means that we use the iterative process. We make the game, we are very flexible with changing things. We are actually at a state now um, in, in the development of the studio, we don't have a lot of extensive design documentation. We found that probably after we hit Fallout 3, the design docs that we had became outdated very quickly because we knew we needed to get stuff in the game and play it and then change it. We needed to iterate on it. So we would have these extensive 50-page design documents that were completely outdated, and the time it took to maintain those just wasn't worth it. And so great games are played, not made, means that as a studio, um, you know, we are constantly iterating. But also, on a personal level, on a designer level, when I work with my designers, with, with the designers at the studio, um, Great games are played, not made, means that we have very, very good extensive tools for creating content at Bethesda. Um, in fact, we release those tools publicly. Anyone here can download them and make, and make stuff with it. Um, so it's very easy to use those tools and to create content. But it's incumbent upon every designer and everyone at the studio that makes the content to go into the game and play it and see if it's any good. Uh, and so on a personal level, on a designer level, that's what it means. Great games are played, not made. It means play your own stuff. Uh, and, and it sounds, actually, it's funny because that sounds very common sense, like a no-brainer, right? But it's actually very difficult to get people to play their own stuff. It's, very, it's difficult for me to play my own stuff um, because there's, there's a frightening realization that you have great ideas. Things look great on paper. Then you put it in the game. Especially when it's your own stuff, everything's brilliant. Everything you do is brilliant, it's gonna be great. Uh, you write your design documents, and then you play it in the game, and wow, it sucks, right? Everyone, every game developer has gone through that. Uh, and so, you have to, there's a, a moment of fear where you have to really come to grips with the fact that maybe the, the content you've created isn't that good. But as a writer, so, let's, so how, do we, how do we look at this with stories, right? Great games are played, not made. Played, that's the key word, right? Because every game developer is a storyteller in an interactive medium. Um, you are not writing a screenplay. You are not writing a novel. You are writing a piece of fiction that has um, an important interactive component. And so this is uh, some of the team members, these are some of the Quest designers at Bethesda Game Studios. Um, they are not the only designers. In fact, a lot of the quests are also made by our level designers, um, our character artists, our world artists. They're a handsome bunch, I know. Um, and of course, this is, uh, this is Corey. She's our, uh, our first uh, female uh, quest designer. She's awesome. She's also notoriously camera shy, so I threatened to draw her in MS Paint if she didn't get her picture taken. So I did just that. Uh, but they're great, and I work with this team to create our stories. And um, you know, but like I said, we you know our stories are are played, uh, not made. And so th this slide I know is coming out of nowhere. What does this possibly have to do with anything, right? Like this is Han and Chewie from Star Wars. Everything goes back to Star Wars, right? That that should be a, a slide on its own, right? I love the scene in Star Wars. What's happening here in Star Wars? This is. Uh, Han Solo has been frozen, and he comes out and he says, I've been out for a little while, and everyone's having delusions of grandeur, right? That's what this slide is about, delusions of grandeur. So, when we start writing a story at Bethesda, when I start working with the team, we start big. Like, you know, we always want to do this. So, we always want to write the great American novel, right? 
Fallout 3 will, you know, will be this big epic thing. You're looking for your father. We'll get Liam Neeson to voice the role of the father. And, you know, so we always want to tell a huge story and, like, the great American novel. We want to be, let's be the great Gatsby. And, you know, or let's be Moby Dick or let's be the Scarlet Letter. Um, and there's, a, there's an inherent problem with that, right? These are all amazing works of fiction. Um, but they're all non-interactive, right? Uh, so when you're writing a story for a video game, you always have to keep the player in mind, right? Um, and so what happens with, we're writing our great American novel. It's, it, it, this is the process, this is what happens at Bethesda when you, when you write the main story of a game, and even some of the smaller stories. So let's say, okay, we're gonna write the great American novel. It's gonna be this thing. And on every page will be written comedy and tragedy, and it'll be wonderful, it'll be amazing. And you're gonna give this book, this great American novel, to the player. And what are they gonna do with it? They're gonna rip out every page and make paper airplanes out of them. And they're gonna throw them around the room. And they're never gonna see your story. Because the story is there, right? But they are gonna spend 30 hours making shacks, okay? They're gonna spend 20 hours looking for bobbleheads, okay? But that's okay. We know that going in. That's, that's the, the jagged pill that we swallow when we do this. Um, because again, great games are played, not made, and a story in a video game is an interactive thing. Um, and so we know that, and we're comfortable with that. And so for us, we know that the greatest players, uh, the greatest characters in our games are the players themselves, and it's their stories that are important. Uh, it's this gal, it's this guy, you know, it's these folks right here. This is who we're making the game for. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And so, how do we do that? How do we go about creating an interactive story? Well, one of the most important things we did, um, you know, we look at the tools we have available and how do we want to tell that story? And, and what is most important to us? And so for us, we realized that one of the most important thing is people, characters, NPCs, interacting with, with the characters in the world. Um, you know, and again, making sure we remember that you are truly interacting with them, okay? This is the experience. We all, the player has a controller in their hand and, and they can alter the narrative whenever they want. So we started, we knew we needed to redo our dialogue system. That was one of our big things. Because in our game, one of the, the main ways that the player gives information or gets information is through dialogue. So we went back to, we looked at Oblivion's dialogue. We looked at Fallout's dialogue. We looked at Skyrim's dialogue. And I did not realize that guy was naked when I took the slide, but apparently kind of he is. Um, and you, you notice all of these dialogue systems are very similar, right? And we decided we were gonna try to do something different. Oh, and of course, we looked at other games as well. Games that are known for great storytelling and great interactions with characters, right? Mass Effect games, right? Telltale's games, all wonderful. Um, and we knew, uh, we knew that we needed to have voice protagonists. That was a big step for us. Um, so we got uh, Courtney and Brian, two amazing actors we got, worked very closely with. Um, and it's, God, I've, I've lost track, but Fallout 4 has something like 120,000 lines of spoken dialogue, and I think 40 or 50% of that is actually um, the player character dialogue. And so they had a lot of work over a, a lot of months. And we knew that that was part of it. Because we realized that when you're trying to relay emotion, um, the, you know, the story that we wanted to tell in Fallout, which is, you know, ultimately the story of you looking for your, uh, your child, um, we knew that we needed two actors who could relay that sort of emotion, and we needed a, a voice protagonist to do that. It was a very controversial choice within the studio. It's the first time we had ever done that. Um, and there's something to be said for the silent protagonist, right? So you can have the voice in your head. Uh, but we knew that in order to tell the story the way we wanted to, we were gonna have to voice them. And so the, the scheme we had for dialogue was actually really simple. You know, if you look at it, you know, and this translates to the PC, you know, to mouse and keyboard as well, but if you look at a standard controller, you know, the, the general gist was, you know, 
A would be a positive response, X would be a neutral response, B would be a negative response, and Y would be a question, okay? And so that would allow us to have more um, fluid interactions with our characters. And so, you know, this is, a, this is the salesman at the beginning of the game. And when you talk to him, you, have, you know, you can choose. Everything's pretty much, you know, not interested, negative, A, positive, question, neutral, right? You know, and then we, then we develop a third-person camera system. But there were some issues with this, of course. Um, and again, this goes back to great games were played, not made, right? It always goes back to the player. Originally, when we had our, um, our dialogue system implemented, you could not skip through lines of dialogue. You had to sit there and listen to everything a character said. You, in essence, had to listen to the words that the designers wrote, that the stories they created. And what we found in the studio was that by popular demand, we had to give the option to skip dialogue. Because even in the studio, when we're playing it, people wanted to skip dialogue, right? They, they, could, they could read the subtitles quicker than they could listen. Or sometimes they just weren't interested in what an NPC had to say, okay? So, so that's, a, that's a tough thing to accept, right? Like, we create these stories, and the player doesn't want to hear them or doesn't want to experience them. But that's okay, okay? They spent the money. They bought the game. They're experiencing it the way they want. And so this is just an example of, and, and by the way, this, so the, the dialogue system, as you see, it's very fluid in the game. You know, you have like, every time you talk to an NPC, there are four options. Well, for the designers, this was something of a nightmare because every interaction with any NPC meant that they had to write four responses for anything. You know, they might want to tell a guy that like, yeah, the, the restrooms are over there, but they had to write that for it in four different ways, right? It became a, a logistical nightmare. And so this is, a, this is one of the smaller interactions. Um, you can just see how, you know, and there are, the, our editor, our tool is full and full and full of this kind of stuff. Um, and th this is my, this slide sums up all the horrors of the dialogue. Those are the designers wanting to kill me. That's the spaghetti-like structure, and that's all the designers uh, in the mental institution at the end of the project. We actually, trying to create the story for this game and using the dialogue system was incredibly difficult. Um, just because, um, you know, they're doing all this work, and work takes time. And as every, you know, everyone who's a game developer knows that creating a game is a time-consuming process anyway. But when you're adding to that, you know, this is time you don't get to see your family or, or have a weekend to yourself. It became very difficult. Now, the other problem with all this dialogue is that because our tools are so robust, a designer can start writing dialogue very quickly, even in pre-production. So for, I'd say a good two years in any of the games we do, a lot of the quests, that's, you know, some people call them missions, we have always called them quests. The quests are very basic. They might be, um, you know, the NPCs are wearing rags, they're not wearing their actual clothes, their faces aren't done yet. They're standing in a blank room, in an empty room. There are no animations. Because all that stuff is being built by our different departments. But the one thing that we can do quickly, that the, the designers can do quickly, is write dialogue and write books. And that becomes a danger for us, especially in this interactive medium, right? Because we don't want the player's interactive, interactive experience to just be sitting there listening to dialogue and reading books. And so this, what this is right here, lore bombs, no lore bombs. That's what we call them at the studio. A lore bomb is any time there's a giant dump of text or audio that explains something away, a lore bomb. And we still use them sometimes, you know, we try to get better at it. But we like to tell our stories not just through dialogue, just, not just through writing, but interactively. And so, you know, what that means is we have amazing environment artists, um, and we found over the years that it's almost become a trope now that, 
you know, a, a dead body with a, a, a gun and a cup of coffee next to him sort of tells its own story, right? We, we do that a lot. We try to tell our stories through the environment, you know? Um, so this scene is from, kind of hard to make out, this is the very beginning of Skyrim. You're in a car, um, being transported to your own execution. You can't even, your hands, you, ha you can't talk to the other NPCs, there's no dialogue. Your hands are bound. Um, so you have very little interaction. It's, it's basically a like bus ride, right? Um, and so I worked with one of, the one of the designers, William Shen, on this sequence in particular. How do we make this an interactive experience, even though we can? Um, and we just try to leverage every tool that we have. So you can turn your you can look at things. And so what we did is we used the, the other NPCs in the cart to sort of narrate. Um, so you know, you look someplace and he's like, oh, I, I used to, I knew a girl in this village, or you know, I, I remember fighting over here. Um, and so even when we knew that we, you know, it's a non inter even in, a, in a, an interactive game like Skyrim, a, the most non-interactive experience is still a little bit interactive because we're always trying to keep the player's experience in mind. Now when you go to Fallout 4, um, looking at some of the things we did in Fallout 4, we try to put all this stuff together to tell our stories. So great games are played, not made. Interaction is always important. Because we tell our stories through quests, a lot of times, um, even that is difficult for us. How do you start a quest? Um, you know, it's very easy to go up to someone and have them tell you what to do, or give, or give you a sort of like, this guy wants help. It's kind of boring, right? So in this quest in particular, um, Diamond City Blues, this whole quest starts, you, you witness a fight in a tavern, right? So you, it's a very interesting, and you can get involved or not get involved. Um, and throughout the course of this quest, and actually, you want to talk about a quest that had reams and reams of dialogue and, and loads of stuff, this quest in particular, because this quest is, is an example of, this quest to me is, is a really, Kurt Coleman is the designer who did this, and he did a fantastic job. And I'll tell you why, is because most of the work he did on this quest you'll never see. Because this quest, it branches so many different ways. Get involved, don't get involved. Kill this guy, don't kill this guy. Every time you make a decision, it affects something else. Um, and, and again, we were always thinking of the player, thinking of the player's experience and what's important to them. Uh, this is Salem, Massachusetts. Um, you know, the witch trials, Salem witch trials. This is the um, Salem Museum of Witchcraft. This quest in the game, it, it came close to, this close to getting cut. I mean, it was like, one conversation away from never being in the game. It went through so many iterations. Um, again, how do we tell this story? How do we involve the, the player in this story? And again, like, sometimes the stories, when you're making a game, the story that you write um, on paper has to change. So with this quest, the example with this quest, we were leveraging things we didn't have, okay? Because Salem, when I think Salem, I think witches, I actually, actually lived in Salem for a while. We thought, well, maybe we'll actually have characters that can act like witches, but they're, they're using radiation to sort of like, you know, use powers that look like witchcraft, kind of like the X-Men or something, right? Um, and we'll do that, we'll leverage Skyrim's magic system, right? Because we still have it in the code. And we had it in the code. It got ripped out at some point, okay? So we didn't have that anymore. And so we weren't going to recreate that entirely just for one quest. It wasn't going to happen. So then we said, okay, it'll be the story of these two towns that are warring against each other. Wrote the story on paper, sounded great. What happens in the game? We compress our map. We can't build everything. So those two towns actually sort of became one town. So you can't have two towns fighting against each other when there's just one town. And so then we, you know, we, and it had gone through like three, every, all the designers were so busy, and it had gone through like three designers, four designers. And uh, we finally come to, you know, one of our newest designers at that point, um, Liam. He's like, you know what, let me, let me give it a shot. And so I worked with him to like, we had all these different options, and it, it turned out we did a very simple, very simple quest. Everything is contained in this building. You fight a Deathclaw, one of the scariest creatures in Fallen. 
Um, and it turned out really great. It was a, uh, a self-contained experience. Uh, and it was an example of how I work with my team to help craft these stories and how looking at the player and the player's experience were constantly changing things and constantly keeping the player in mind. And of course, uh, Preston Garvey, head of the Minutemen, who we, uh, we decided to do something different with him. And, uh, and Preston Garvey, if you've played the game, will give you uh, quests for the Minutemen, and these are radiant quests, they never end. And Preston basically sits on his ass while you do everything yourself, right? Uh, so it's, it's content that never ends for the player, but it's, it's, you know, sometimes gets a little overbearing. Um, oh, we've got Paladin Dance, another great example. Paladin Dance, spoilers incoming, sorry if you haven't played the game. If you haven't played Fallout 4, I'm sorry, that's your problem, so this is spoiler territory now. So Paladin Dance, when you're playing the game, he is uh, an important character in the Brotherhood of Steel. It also turns out that he has a, a very important secret. Um, and when you uncover this secret, and you go to Elder Maxon, the head of the Brotherhood of Steel, um, we had this idea on paper, sounded great, that you will, if Elder Maxon, the head of the Brotherhood of Steel, doesn't like Paladin Dance and wants to kill him, you can kill Elder Maxon and you can become uh, the head of the Brotherhood of Steel. And it sounds great, right? Like on paper, of course. You know, I, I kill the head of the organization, I become the head of the organization. So we did that. That was the story we decided to tell. And we actually had recorded some audio, um, and we were going down this path, and then we started playing this in the studio. And so what happens is, you kill Elder Max, and you become the head of this faction, and it felt wrong. And it felt wrong because everyone else in the faction, all the other members of the Brotherhood of Steel, felt the same way that Elder Maxon did. They didn't like this guy. They didn't like his secret. And it felt very wrong that you could take over the organization and, and everybody just accepted magically that, that it was okay that he had the secret. So we changed it. Um, And it's funny because when it got out on the internet, they're like, no, oh, this story would have been so much better this way. Actually, it wasn't because we had it that way. And we played it and looking at the player's experience, it just, it wasn't working. Another character, one of my favorites, Nick Valentine. He's the, the synth detective. Um, you know, we were trying to figure out what to do with him and his story. And he became, a, he became one of the most popular companions in the game. You can take him with you he'll adventure with you and uh, you know working on his story how his story is one that unfolds over the course of the entire game and it is one of and again it's one of these quests that it is not meant to, and this is another problem for us when we tell our stories um, we think big and, and sometimes you know the the player wants to throw their paper airplanes they want to build their shacks um, sometimes they don't sometimes they actually want to experience a story all at once and when we think that they're gonna experience it a little bit of a, a, at a time. So Nick Valentine's story is actually spread throughout the game. It takes quite a while to uncover the whole thing. You have to adventure with him for a while, um, become his companion, and only when he feels comfortable with you will he share more of his story, and then you can do more of that adventure with him. And just so wrapping around, you know, um, great games are played, not made, and, and looking at the advantages that, that stories and games have, you know, I like to compare sometimes film and games, and I think um, The Warriors, one of my favorite movies, um, you know, it's great to sit there in the audience and watch this story of these, you know, uh, guys dressed up in these baseball, baseball outfits, but you know, why do that, why watch that when you can experience it, okay, because as game creators, we offer our players experience, a fictional experience that you simply can't get watching film, right? You get to be part of it, okay? The Revenant, right? Everyone loves to see him. Leo fighting the bear. Fight, you know, watching Leo fight the bear is great. Fighting the bear yourself, also pretty great, okay? Controlling that narrative. And this slide's actually not fair, all right? I, I, I fully admit, The Red Wedding, okay? Everyone loves The Red Wedding, me too. So this is, this is a cheap shot. 
But, uh, you know, the advantage of games is that, you know, not only can you watch the Red Wedding, you can cause the Red Wedding. Which, this is a, this is a Skyrim Dark Brotherhood quest that I, I want, like, as soon as I got the, the assignment to do the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim, I'm like, gotta do the Red Wedding. Uh, like, well, come on, right? Like, you know, gotta kill the bride of the Red Wedding, right? So wrapping all this stuff back around, point one, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. This is, you know, look at a strong central theme. Don't overtell your story. Um, look at what's important. Two, write what you know. Draw upon your own personal experiences, right? Um, that's why there are so, much, so many stereotypical characters, I think, now, because people aren't looking at real characters. They aren't looking at real people, you know? Um, Step outside your own backyard and meet some people, and you'll find there are a lot of different people out there. Um, and three, great games are played, not made. And of course, if you do all this and you tell your story, you know, if you get lucky, extremely, extremely fortunate, you get to, you know, see the fruits of your labor, see your, your game on the shelves or, or in the store. But that's not the end, though. That's not the end of being a video game uh, developer. Because the true mark of being a, a tr uh, of a real developer is, as every developer knows, is waiting for reviews to come in, right? And then reading the reviews, of course, and hopefully, if you get lucky, ignoring the reviews, right? Thank you very much, guys.